good morning, Victor Hamilton Mill. How you guys doing this morning? Oh, yeah, that's some energy in the house. Well, I'm excited to be here. Uh, for those of you who are new here, my name is Darius Dunson, and I am the executive director of Member Care. I'm primarily at our Norcross campus. I get the privilege of overseeing our uh, connections, our small groups, and also our pastoral care communities down there. And I'm glad to be with you guys. It's always a privilege. Well, we've been continuing in this series entitled Crazy Love. I'm, the, I'm actually the 11th person to stand on this stage and uh, preach on this series, and I'm talking to you, to you today about loving through community. And speaking of community, I do want to highlight the most important person in my community, my wife of 22 years and four children, <laughs> Melba Alicia Dunson. I say this all the time, uh, I love it that her initials spell mad, because every day she makes me so mad, Lee, in love with her. <laughs> I love you, babe. Well, look, I'm excited to be here, and I want to go ahead and just dive in, because this is a important, an important subject, and as you can see, I got my community shirt on because we want to represent across all campuses this weekend about how God loves through community. You know, the world has been changing fast. Um, there's an epidemic that has been arising in the world, and uh, it's not your typical epidemic. It's not uh, the opioid crisis. It's not the rise of vaping in the lives of teenagers, and it's definitely not a uh, baby shark, doop, doop, da doop, da doop. <laughs> That's definitely an epidemic. When you have 3.2 billion people that go to view baby shark, that's a problem. This epidemic, researchers and uh, studies, they call it the loneliness epidemic. That people are increasingly lonely. We're more isolated in our behavior. Uh, we no longer drive with the windows down. We drive with the windows up. We walk around in stores with earplugs in our ears. The porch is no longer, it's just a doorway. It's no longer a place where we connect with our neighbors. We are increasingly isolated, and especially uh, with social media, we have more interactions with more people who know us less when we should be having more interactions with less people that know us more. So we have an issue uh, on our hands that's a rising epidemic. The uh, researchers say that 50%, almost 50% of Americans say that they are lonely or they feel alone. So we do have a problem that we need to solve. Can we all agree that we have a problem of loneliness? Now, there was a children's book that came out by Susie Becker. And in this children's book, she interviewed elementary students to ask them how to solve the world's problems. And one of the problems she gave them to solve was concerning this question right here. She said, with billions of people in the world, someone should be able to figure out a system where no one is lonely. What do you suggest? So here's the answers. Kalani, age eight, said, People should find lonely people and ask their name and address, then ask people who aren't lonely their name and address. When you have an even amount of each, assign lonely and not lonely people together in the newspaper. <laughs> Man, if it was just that simple. Check this one out. This is a good one right here. Max, age nine, he said, make food that talks to you when you eat. <laughs> for instance, for instance, it would say, how are you doing? And what happened to you today? Now that sounds like a horror film. <laughs> now look, if I'm, up, if I'm about to eat a cheeseburger and it says, how are you doing? Man, I'm throwing that thing so far away from me. <laughs> but hey, that's an answer. Matt, age eight, he said, we could get people a pet or a husband or a wife and take them places. Makes you wonder what his definition of marriage is. <laughs> then you had Brian, 
Here's a good one. Brian AJ, he says this. He said, sing a song, stomp your feet, read a book. Sometimes I think no one loves me, so I do one of these. Mm. If loneliness needs to be a problem, if loneliness is the problem, and we need to solve this problem, if, it's the, if loneliness is the epidemic, then community is the antidote. Uh, Mother Teresa said this. She said, loneliness is the leprosy of modern society, and no one wants anybody to know they're a leper. But one thing's for sure, we don't lack uh, being around people. There's people everywhere. There's people in traffic. There's people um, in the grocery stores. There's people in fitness places. There's people all around us all the time. Uh, we can be in large subdivisions and come to a large church like this, so there's not a lack of interactions with people. And just because of that, today, here's the thing, I want to do something different. I want to make sure each and every person who leaves out of here today that someone knows your name. Now, you're probably wondering, how are we going to do that? <laughs> we're going to play a game right now. Here's what we're going to do. I want everyone to stand up in this room right now. And there's going to be three questions. What is your name? What city, state, or country are you from? And what's your favorite food? That's going to be on the screen right here. And we're going to take just a moment for you to find someone who you don't know their name. You're going to ask them these questions. And my favorite song is going to come on while we're doing this. All right, y'all ready? All right, on the count of three, one, two, three, go. Wouldn't you like to get away? <laughs> All those nights when you've got no lights, the check is in the mail. And your little angel hung the cat up by its tail. And your third fiance didn't show. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. If you finish with one person, find someone else. Find another person. Minute, minute, yeah. Be glad there's one place in the world where everybody knows your name. All right. All right. Go ahead and make your way back to your seat. Come on, y'all. I know some of you enjoy that, right? Some of you said, man, I did not come to church to meet anybody today. I just came to hear a message and leave. But no, look, if you can't learn people's or know what people's names are in church, where else are you going to find out? who people are. So this is a great opportunity. We need to be in community. It's important that we're connected to others. It's important that we are in a space that we create community. So here's what we want to do today. Today, before we leave here today, here's what I want you to be saying. Our goal is that you would walk out of here and say, I will create community. As a matter of fact, let's say that one time with me. Say, I will create community. Now, some of you are saying, uh, I'm not sure if I want to say that because I don't know exactly what you mean when you say community. I want to make sure I know what you're talking about. Community, simply put, is common unity. It is common unity. It is us getting together, being connected, connecting with other people as unified individuals, uh, uni unified values, and unified Interest and God wants us connected to one another. He don't want. He doesn't want us isolated. He wants us connected to other people. He doesn't want anyone in here to feel lonely. He wants us to solve the loneliness epidemic. So 
Today, there's three things that we're going to do. We're going to talk about three uh, different things that will allow us to get a picture of what it means to make community so that we can walk out of here today saying, I will create community. First of all, we're going to talk about God's plan for community. Then we're going to talk about our plan, which is Victory World Church, our plan for community. And then we're going to talk about your plan for community. So God's plan, our plan, and your plan. So let's talk about God's plan for community. So first of all, I want you to know that community is something that has always been from the beginning. God has always been in community because community is intrinsic in his nature. I want you to look at this in John 1 verses 1 and 2. It says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So you have God, the Father, and the Son in the beginning. God was in the beginning as one communal God. Community is who he is. And we also know that the Holy Spirit was there with them also as we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us, meaning Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God isn't just exemplifying, I am going to be in community. He's saying, I am community. And so in his plan, he creates all the things and he says, you know, he created light, he created darkness. He said, all that these things are good. He created the fish of the sea, he created the birds of the air, he created all these things. He said, all of these things are good. But then he gets down to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and we want to read this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So out of all the things that God said was good, we find out right here in this scripture that the one thing that God said is not good is man being alone. So the first thing in the history of the universe that wasn't good was solitude. Think about that. The first bad thing in the earth wasn't mosquitoes or alligators or baby shark. And I hate alligators. My wife can tell you I have dreams, nightmares about alligators frequently. So if anybody can tell me what that's about, I don't know. I've been praying about it for years. <laughs> but the first thing wasn't those things. The first thing that was not good was solitude. And I want to read you something from John Ortberg because when we look at this scripture, I want us to understand that at this point in time, this is a perfect creation. And so he says this, what is striking according to Genesis 2 and 18 is the, that the fall has not yet occurred. There is no sin, no disobedience, no distance between God and man. Man is in a state of perfect intimacy with God. Each word he and God speak with each other is filled with closeness and joy. He walks with God in the garden in the cool of the day, yet the word God uses to describe him is alone. And God says, this aloneness is not good. So here's the thing. We often tell people, uh, all you need is God. But that's not true. It's not true. Um, according to this scripture, you look, we don't just need God. We need people. You know, Adam had all of the cats, the dogs, the ostriches, the orangutans, any animal that he could have, all in his presence. And God said, all of those things are good, are good. But what's not good is that you need to be in community with another person. You see, here's the thing. You can never have community with your pets. You can't. A lot of people want to have community with your pets, but that's unhealthy. Very unhealthy. You know, I had this situation one time. Uh, someone called my wife at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, I'm thinking that it's my, our daughter who's off at college. And I hear on the other end a lot of um, uh, fussing going on on the other side. And so I'm waiting on my wife to get on the phone. She's on the phone for about 15 minutes. She gets off the phone and I say, okay, so 4 o'clock in the morning, who is that? So it was a young lady that she had been trying to help process through some things. And she gives me this look. I was like, so why is she calling 4 o'clock in the morning? She gives me this look. She said, uh, well, uh, she said that she wants to uh, put her roommate out because her roommate stole her pet turtle. <laughs> and I said, so, so 
She said, I, my roommate stole my pet turtle, and when I approached her about stealing my pet, my pet turtle, <laughs> my pet turtle, she told me that she didn't steal it. So she was calling me as a pastor to tell her what do I need to do to get my pet turtle back. At four o'clock in the morning, please don't call a pastor asking them what they want to do with a pet turtle at four o'clock in the morning. You can't have community, you can't have community with pets. You have community with other humans. You have community with people. There is a, a God-shaped void inside of us, but there's also a people-shaped void inside of us that only people can feel. We need community with people. Community is to the human soul what food is to the human spirit. I mean, community is to the human soul what food is to the human body. And I want us to understand that. So God wants us in community because he is community and his plan for the world is community. So Jesus said it best in his last prayer before he is betrayed and crucified. And in this prayer, we get to see that this is Jesus's dream. This is his dream prayer. This is Jesus's, I have a dream speech, so to speak. In this moment, Jesus is telling us what he desires for each and every each and every one of us. He tells us what he desires for the future of the body of Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 20 and 23, he says, I am not praying only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. Verse 23 says, I am in them and you are in me May they experience such, such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. So here's God's plan. Jesus wants us to be one in community, one in common unity, so that the world would know that he is Lord and that they are loved by him. He wants us to be one in common unity so that the world will know that he is Lord and that they are loved by him. So Jesus dies, resurrects from the grave, goes away, he sends the Holy Spirit, and then we go and look over in the book of Acts chapter two and we see what happens. They caught the dream. We see that the church has caught the dream for community in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 44. We see the, the church is vibrant and it's moving. We see right here it says in verse 44, all of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, that's God plan, God's plan for community. His plan for community is that we would be one, that we would be together. And as we can see in the book of Acts, they caught it. They caught the dream. And I can imagine back then as they catch the dream, catch the dream, they're hanging out together in each other's houses, they're having uh, grill outs and barbecues, I can see them laying out some lamb ribs, anybody had lamb ribs? Yeah. Somebody had lamb ribs, I've never had them but they just sounded good when I said it. <laughs> but they had lamb ribs, they're talking about the great miracles that God is doing all around Jerusalem and they're seeing that people are adding to, to the church daily all of those that would be saved and here's the thing that is what God's plan of community is his plan of community is that we would be one together so that we could show the world that he is Lord he is Lord and that he loves them and that's what God's plan of community is and that's where it comes to our plan of community we want to carry on the dream that Jesus had from the church for the church from the beginning we want to start out just like the church did in the book of Acts we want to be sharing our lives together. We want to be uh, gathering in community together. We want to be hanging out eating lamb ribs with raised spicy barbecue ribs on them. That's what we want to do when it comes to community. And so our plan of community, as we spoke about God's plan for community, our plan for community is to carry the dream. We want to continue to carry Jesus' dream. 
So the way we want to do that is through our small groups. We want to do that through small groups community. And our vision for small groups is to create authentic community where we cultivate friendships as we pursue discipleship. Simply put, we're making friends becoming disciples. Making friends becoming disciples. And I want you to think about this. A lot of times we put a lot of emphasis on discipleships, but look, making friends is a big theme in the Bible. Think about it. Adam was a friend of God. The Bible says he walked with God in the cool of the day. Abraham was a friend of God. Moses was a friend of God. And then when we go over into the New Testament, God himself on the scene through Jesus Christ, John 15 and 15, he says this to those who he did life with. This is what he says. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not understand what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Because everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. So the goal is not only to gather. Remember, there's people gathering in groups all the time. You're around people all the time, but still people can gather and still be lonely or not known. The goal is that we would come together and we would make friends as we become disciples. We would make friends and become disciples so the world could know that Jesus is alive. So here's the thing. Let's talk about making friends. There's two things that we need to do to make friends. Friends play together and friends pray together. Say that with me. Play together and pray together. Friends play, play together and friends pray together. Now, playing is a little different for me now. I'm, I'm 45 years old. You know, a lot of you young guys, you want to go out and play football. I'm not playing football with you. I might hurt something or sprain a knee, and my wife will be really upset with me. But playing for me just looks like me doing something that I love to do with people that I love to do life with. That's where most of my friendships come from, you know, Playing for me, as you probably already heard, is, you know, sitting on the back with the grill, a few friends around, us eating, us laughing, me talking about them, them talking about me, and just laughing and having a good time. That is play, and that is all the play that I need. But playing for you may look different. You may be the type that you want to, you know, you want to go and uh, take a trek up into the Appalachians. That's not me. I don't like running into bears in, on paths or anything like that. But playing is something that we have to do in order for us to get to know people. You know, when we look at Merriam-Webster, the, the definition in Merriam-Webster for community is common. It's that people with common interests. It talks about people with common interests. And so when it comes to making friends, we need to be gathering with people, having fun, doing things that we love to do. No one wants to gather around and make friends concern around something that we don't love to do. And so I love to play. I know you have some things that you love to do. You know, you may be one of those people who like to cook, which is something that I love to do. I love to cook. Um, about three years in our marriage, I realized I, I love to cook. And, you know, from that point on in time, for the last 19 years, I've been the primary cook in my family because it's just something that I love to do. And I love it so much, my wife is clapping. <laughs> but I love it so much that one time I had the opportunity to gather and make friends in a small group with a cooking group called Men Player men playing with fire any men playing with fire alumni in here oh yeah that we got one <laughs> Aaron Bourne our men's pastor so we would get together and we would get together and we would cook these recipes and man it was so fun for me I don't know if it was fun for them I don't know if they like to cook but it was fun for me it was the highlight of my week we would get together during lunch we would cook, and we did this for some months, and at the end of those months, we had a cooking contest where we called in three judges, and the prize would be bragging rights. So we had the cooking contest. All of us laid our food down, and I never got to uh, really acknowledge those bragging rights, so I'm going to acknowledge them. Guess who won? No one who is not on this stage right now. 
I won the cooking contest and these are my bragging rights, but it was something that we got together and we began to gather and make friends and it was a small group. And so friendship is important to God. Sometimes we deprioritize friendship because we make discipleship more important, but they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. As we see, Jesus did not pull friendship away from discipleship. He put them both together. His ultimate tag that he put on those disciples was not, were not disciples. His ultimate tag he put on them was friend. His ultimate tag on Abraham was friend. And our ultimate uh, goal should not just be discipleship. Our goal should be friendship. So friends play together, but friends also pray together. Now, when it comes to praying together, um, praying together requires that you be vulnerable. And one of the main things that it takes to build friendship is vulnerability. You know, we have to be able to be in an environment that we can take the mask off. You know, the my life is perfect mask. You know, nothing's wrong with me mask. Everything is going great mask. Do you have a real life community, a real group, pe group of people that you can ask them to pray for the things that go on in your life? Do you have that? You know, I would love to say that everything in my life is always going great. And everything is always beautiful, but that is not the case. My life has some challenges. My life has some struggles. And I know if my life has some challenges and some struggles, I know that there's people in this room right now that you have some challenges and struggles. Just right now, how many of you could use a person to pray for you about one particular area in your life right now? Some people don't want to put their hands up because you could think I'm going to make you rise up and start praying for each other. No, I'm not going to do that. But we all need people to pray for us. And when we pray for each other, what we do is make ourselves vulnerable to other people. And prayer is one of those things that we need. Vulnerability is one of those things we need. We need people to know who we are. We need people to know what we're going through. Brene Brown said this about vulnerability. She has a lot of quotes on vulnerability. This is what she said. Vulnerability is our most accurate measurement of courage. Think about that. Because oftentimes we can hide. Oftentimes we don't want to share what's really going on in our life because we're afraid that we may be rejected. But when we open ourselves up to be vulnerable, we give people an opportunity to know who we are. And we need to see people's lives and people, needs to see, people need to see our lives. So, Making friends, friends pray together, friends play together, and friends pray together. Becoming disciples, let's talk about that. Here's what happens when we are in discipleship community. Becoming disciples, disciples pray together, and disciples pursue God together. Now notice I use pray together in both because prayer is the place where friendship and discipleship meets. It's in that place that we begin to continue a life that is rooted in God, that we're dependent upon God. So prayer is the place where friendship and discipleship meets. So let's talk about pursuing God together. You know, uh, discipleship is not a destination. It's not a, a class that you go to and you get a certificate of verification that says, I am a disciple and you arrive. Discipleship requires continuity. Discipleship requires continuous walking with God, and you don't ever, quote unquote, arrive at the place or a pinnacle of discipleship. I want you to read to you what Jesus said uh, about discipleship in John 8 31. He said, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Notice he said, Continue. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. A disciple's pursuit is to make other disciples. That's what we want to do. And discipleship does not happen apart from community. It happens within community. You cannot make another disciple by being distant from them. You have to be connected to them and be in, be in, in each other's lives so that you can know what's going on with that person and you can grow together. You have to do it and we have to do it just like Jesus did it. And in Proverbs 27 and 17, this is a scripture that says, it says, iron sharpens iron. 
so one person sharpens another. And I want you to think about this. Imagine if you went into a restaurant and, you know, the guy came up and he started sharpening, sharpening his knives and you didn't hear any clinging. You were like, what is he doing? But what happens when that, those knives hit, they clash, there's conflict, there's friction. That's because when you are doing life with one another, there's conflict, there's friction, there's things that have to be work, worked out. And that's what discipleship looks like. It doesn't mean that you always agree with each other. It doesn't mean that you're always on the same page. It means that you come together no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, and you come together with the primary objective to bring glory to God so that you can fulfill the dream that, ha that Jesus had for us back in uh, John chapter 15. You want to fulfill that dream. So discipleship requires us to be life on life, connected to each other, in common unity with the, each other so that we can fulfill Jesus' dream for community. So we have God's plan for community. We have our plan for community. Now let's talk about your plan for community. And I want us to get this because we talked about our vision, making friends, becoming disciples. Let's see if we could take that and put it in our own personal context. Because community is not one size fits all. You know, like I said earlier, when it comes to making friends or playing together, all of us like different things. We have different experiences. So, what I want you to do is look at this scripture, and this is where we can begin when it comes to our plan for a community. Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. I want to read that again. I want you to take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life and place it, place it before God as an offering. So here's what you can do for your plan to, to make community. You can take what you love to do, you can place it before God as an offering and build community, whatever that may be. As I told you, I like to cook, so I had a cooking small group. There's plenty of people, they like to run. So you could take that ordinary thing that you do in your life, you can place it before God, and you can gather people around what you love to do, and they love to do also, and you can create community. You can build friendships, and you can make disciples. You can take whatever it is. You may, you may be a, some person, look, I love to hike. I'm going to go hiking. Gather some people around that. Rally some people around that, and you can go hike with a group of people. You may be a person who loves to go to the movies. You say, hey, every month we're going to go and watch a PG movie. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just playing. No, you don't need to be watching crazy stuff now. But you can gather people around things that you love to do, and you can create uh, community. You can take your ordinary life and make it extraordinary. Remember what Moses had? Moses had a stick. He placed it before God, one stick, and God used that stick to deliver a million people from the bondage of Egypt. What could God do if we would place whatever we do, whatever ordinary thing that happens in our life, we place it before God, imagine what he could do through us if we just gave it over to him as an offering, built community, fulfilled Jesus' dream for community, and imagine what the world could turn into. We could solve the loneliness epidemic, and no one would have to spend hours on YouTube watching Baby Shark do 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 the things that we could do if we were to lay before God the things that we already do, not out of the context of our lives. Because some of you may be saying, well, I don't have time to do that. Well, I know one thing we all have time to do. We all have time to eat, right? And I want you to think about this because in the book of Acts, the thing that they gathered around for community was eating. <laughs> It said they ate from house to house. All of us have a dinner time. All of us have a time where we sit down and eat. You can gather people, hey, come do dinner with me. Let's talk about some things. 
Let's share some things. So what is your plan to create community? Take what you love to do. Rally some people around that. You know, there are people who would never come to church with you, but they will run with you or watch a movie with you. People who will never come to church. And that's what was happening in the book of Acts. There was no church building that people could go, through, go to. But people just were gathering people in their homes. And people were giving their life to Christ and surrendering their heart to Jesus just because the church decided, let's not make it difficult. Let's make it simple. Let's fulfill the dream that Jesus prayed, that we would be one, common unity. We would gather around interests so that God can get the glory and the world could know that Jesus is Lord and that he loves them because he sees, we, because they see the love that we have for each other. So, um, I want you to think about this before we leave today. I had a very interesting opportunity yesterday um, to, and I, I want to call it an opportunity because it was, it was, it was an opportunity. It was a privilege. Uh, I had the opportunity of officiating the funeral of one of our small group leaders yesterday, Yima Kasango Thorne. Um, I married her and her husband uh, about four years ago in their home, and at the early age of 47, she, she died. And yesterday, we had her funeral. And man, one of the greatest things that I saw, that, that place was packed with over 300 people at the funeral and one of the things that was so, I would just say something that just championed my heart, just made me say, man, I wonder if my last hurrah will be like this. That there was small group leader, there were people who were in small group with her over the years, since 2005, since she's been at Victory. Person after person after person getting up and saying, this is what she meant to me. This is the time that she spent with me. And at the end of the day, about 15 people actually came up. And we don't normally do that, but we had to because she had impacted so many people's lives and primarily through small groups. And so at the end of that, I asked myself, I said, man, what will my last hurrah be like? What community is going to show up for me what are they going to say about me? People were so amazed that she was able to spend that much time with so many people. And I was looking at it and I was trying to figure out how did she get around to all of these people? And it wasn't that she was doing it at the same time. She was really, when it boiled down to it, I, I kept hearing key phrases. It would say, they would say, you know, we went to get something to eat. We were at the park. We were at a restaurant. She was at my birthday party. You know, we were walking together. All of these different spaces that she presented to God as an offering for her life and was building community with it. And so after that funeral, I just stood everybody one up and I've never done this. I said, listen guys, I have to do this right now. I just want to take a moment and applaud Yama Thorne for everything that she's done in everyone's life. Everyone got up and we just applauded her. We took about 10 to 15 seconds, applauded and screamed because she was truly one, someone who laid down her life and she didn't even do it outside of the context of what she normally did. Her boss got up and talked about what she was doing at work. People in the other cubicle wrote letters and said, while we were in our cubicles, she was talking to me about my life. She was solving my life's problems. And that's what we get an opportunity to do. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a moment. I want to give you uh, an opportunity to just consider, how can I make community? What's my plan for community? Three things that you can do. First thing that you can do when it concerns community, you can decide, you know what? I want to lead a small group. I want to lead a small group. I want to just take something that I love to do and I want to bring some people in with me and I want to join together with them and we're just going to do life together. I want, to take an, I want to take a shot at solving the loneliness epidemic. I want to fulfill Jesus' dream. And so on the screen, 
right now you're going to see that you can text 25827 uh, text lead group to, to 25827 and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to give, us an, give you an opportunity to be a part of a training that's going to happen next week at our Norcross campus at 915. We would love for anyone who wants to lead a group to be a part of that, to be there and begin to, com to fulfill Jesus' dream for a community. Some of you may say, you know what, I don't necessarily know if I want to lead a group, but I do need community. I'm feeling lonely myself. I would love to join in community. You can text JOIN GROUP to that same number, 25827, and be a part of community also. And there may be someone in here that may be saying, you know what, um, I'm already a part of great community. Uh, I don't necessarily need to create community. I would say to you, you are a prime example of what Jesus would use to continue to fulfill his dream. Don't be a bystander. Participate. Be in community. Lead with community. And lastly, I would say to someone here, uh, you may say, you know what, I don't necessarily want to lead a group, or, and, but I do have a, a, a nice home. The Lord has blessed me with a nice space. Uh, I would say to you, you could host a group in your home. You could take someone who you know may want to leave a, lead a group, some, a friend of yours, and you say, hey, would you join with me to begin a, a, a community in, our, in my home? You may like providing host, hospitality. That could be a way that you could join in, in, into community. So I want to just encourage us to take one of those steps as we leave here today. I want you to say this with me one more time. Say, I will create community. I believe that if we take that approach, if we take the heart that I will create community, we'll be following along with God's plan for community. We'll be aligning ourselves with the vision of victory, our plan for community, and your plan for community will make friends and make people become disciples. I want to pray for us, and I want to just close us out. I want to uh, take a moment, and some of you may be here, I want you to just close your eyes and not because this is a uh, private moment, but because this is a personal moment. Some of you may say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not necessarily one who can create community. I'm not necessarily one who even feels like I need to join in community because I don't have community with God. I don't have communion with God. And you may need to take a moment today to say, Lord Jesus, you know what, I want you to come into my life. Let me begin right there. Will you become the Lord of my life? I want to be one with you just like you are one. And so if you say, you know what, Jesus, I want to receive you into my heart today. I want to have communion with you. If that's you and you want to receive him for the first time, just lift your hands in here right now. I see those hands. You can put those hands down. Maybe some of you are here, you may be here and you say, you know what, I've kind of gotten away from uh, the Lord and I do need to come back into community and so I'm going to be a part of creating community but the first thing I need to do is just return to my rightful position in Christ and you say I want to recommit my life to Jesus if that's you put your hands up right now I see those hands you can put those hands down I want you to repeat this prayer after me say Father I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me I thank you that Jesus went in the grave and he rose again on the third day. And because he rose again, you've provided salvation for me. Now I repent of my sin and I cast it over to you. And I believe that you take my sin and you remember it no more. The Holy Spirit, come into my life. Make me new. Make me clean. I believe that I am a child of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want to pray a blessing. Father, I thank you for each and every person that is here today. I thank you, Lord, that we are intent on being in communion with you. And as we are in communion with you, we are intent on fulfilling your dream of common unity, 
that we're going to make friends and become disciples as we see the world change because they'll understand that you are Lord. And we give you praise for that and glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen.